Well, good midday to everyone. My name is Deborah McCarthy, and I'm delighted to join what is our second UNC Global Academy of Diplomacy session covering a key hot topic in, in our national security world. It's a true pleasure to join Ambassador John Teft, my former colleague. We served together in Rome, Italy, and he was my predecessor as ambassador to Lithuania. And also one of the earliest people to sign up for the General and the Ambassador podcast. So welcome to all and thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Stevenson, Carolina's um, Vice Provost for Global Affairs and Chief Global Officer. And I'm pleased to be here with, um, with Deborah and pleased to see our partnership at the Office of the Vice Provost for Global Affairs and UNC Global more broadly. Our partnership with the American Academy of Diplomacy take root. And I look forward to continuing to work with Deborah as it takes flight. For those of you who haven't been able to attend an event as part of our new diplomatic discussion series, today's talk is part of an effort to regularly bring uh, diplomats and foreign affairs practitioners to the Carolina community and into Carolina classrooms. It's part of the charge of my office to infuse the campus with a global mindset. And our partnership with the American Academy of Diplomacy has been central to the launch of the series, which is itself part of a broader effort. Here at Carolina, we're working to strengthen our capacity to educate students about the theory and practice of diplomacy and particularly American diplomacy. We seek to build on UNC's standout strengths in area studies, including five national resource centers, the most of any university in the American Southeast and our advanced language studies. Carolina students who develop sophisticated, a sophisticated understanding of how American diplomacy works will be better prepared to fulfill their potential as the next generation of global leaders. And some Tar Heels may even be drawn to pursue careers in diplomacy, foreign affairs, and national security, as I was, as Ambassador McCarthy was, and as Ambassador Teft was. So our students have listened to a podcast featuring Ambassador Teft. They've had a class to discuss the content. And now we have Ambassador Teft joining us to share more about his experience and more of his expertise. And he'll actually be meeting with the class immediately after, um, after this to talk directly with students and connecting his expertise to their coursework. So by creating opportunities for students to engage with foreign affairs practitioners like Ambassador Teft, we want to highlight the achievements and the meaningful careers that await students who take full advantage of Carolina's language and area studies strengths. The demand for these skills is high and the success stories like Ambassador Teft's are real. Ambassador Teft was a career foreign service officer for more than 45 years. He completed his service as the U.S. Ambassador to the Russian Federation from 2014 to 17. He previously served as the U.S. Ambassador to Lithuania, to Georgia, and Ukraine. He worked his way up the ladder to these key leadership positions, gaining experience as Charge d'Affaires and Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. His other foreign service assignments include Jerusalem, Budapest, and Rome. I can't think of a better person to come and engage with our students than Ambassador Teft. I had the pleasure of working with him in the early 90s during one of the few times in his career when he wasn't working on Russian issues. I was the junior UK desk officer and he was in charge as the office director for Northern Europe, which was uh, 10 countries with some significant portion of global GDP, as I recall at the time, John. The UK, <laughs> Ireland, Benelux, it was a great office, and the Scandinavian countries. He's one of America's most steep Russia experts, but I doubt he would describe himself that way. He was never one to flaunt his numerous achievements or awards, like his two presidential meritorious service awards, his Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award, and his Diplomacy for Human Rights Awards. And that's not even the full list. Ambassador Teff, it's a pleasure to see you again. We're so lucky to have you with us today. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us and our students. The floor is yours. 
Well, thank you very much, Barbara, and uh, also to Deborah. It's really a pleasure to be uh, with everybody today, but especially to be on the same uh, panel here with uh, two of my good friends and uh, distinguished colleagues from the Foreign Service. Uh, let me start uh, with the most important things first. Uh, I want to congratulate all the Tar Heel fans who are on this uh, on this uh, virtual presentation today on your new basketball coach down in North Carolina. I've always admired Hubert Davis as a player and a coach and really a fine man. Um, as some of you who've read my bio know, uh, I'm a Marquette University graduate. So I too am looking forward to a more normal basketball season this year with our new coach, Shaka Smart. Uh, and yes, those of you who are looking over my shoulder, that is my Green Bay Packers cheesehead hanging on the wall right there. More seriously, I thought I'd try today to do two things. First of all, to highlight what I consider three important trends in contemporary Russia. And then second, to look at the direction the new Biden administration seems to be taking toward Russia and the Eurasian region as a whole. And I look forward to discussions with professors Lemke and Jenkins, as well as comments and questions from everybody who's participating today. As a way of understanding Russia, I think we face uh, an understanding Russia as we now approach the halfway point in Putin's fourth presidential term. Let me highlight three trends uh, in contemporary Russia. Uh, my observations, which are admittedly made from a distance due to the COVID restrictions. First of all, there is a growing popular indignation in Russia over the lack of any real future perspective for the country, particularly among the under 35 generation. Protests, as we've seen in recent months and over the past year, are being met with increasingly repressive tactics by the government. Second, Russia is in a long trough of economic stagnation with little real end in sight. Living standards have basically been flat for a decade, and this has fed the declining trust in Putin and his regime. The third major uh, trend that I'd like to highlight is Putin's clinging to his what I call his post-imperial policies with little evidence to date that he really wants to change his approach. Indeed, over the last few weeks, he's dramatically raised pressure on Ukraine with a massive military buildup on land and in the Black Sea adjacent to Ukraine. And this has been accompanied by a very shrill ramp up of propaganda directed at Ukraine, but also against the United States and Europe. As a way of leading into the talking about these three trends, though, let me tell you a, a short story. Uh, I'm going to take you back to June the 12th, 2017. This was Russia Day, it's one of Russia's newest holidays. And this was just a few months before I was due to complete my assignment as ambassador in Moscow and return, return home. That day, I, I was with uh, all the other ambassadors on the main square inside the Kremlin for Putin's annual outdoor barbecue. Every year he gives, uh, he gathers government ministers, politicians, celebrities, diplomatic corps, and prominent Russians from every field. It's really a great chance for the diplomats to hobnob with pol politicians, uh, partly because the politicians often speak more candidly at the event because it's outside and it was harder to monitor conversations. But as we were gathered in that Kremlin yard, something very interesting was happening about a mile from the Kremlin. An unauthorized demonstration had been organized on Tverskaya Street, one of the main streets in central Moscow. The statue of the great Russian poet Pushkin is just off Tverskaya, and for many years, that square around his statue has been the place where demonstrators of all types have gathered. This demonstration was a bit different, however. It was one of what we later tallied were 89 separate demonstrations spread all across the Russian Federation. Alexei Navalny and his opposition team had used the encrypted telegram internet messaging service to organize a nationwide protest across Russia. Frankly, it surprised the Kremlin, and I think it certainly surprised almost all the domestic and international observers. My staff and I noticed another major change about this demonstration. There were many young, more young people out on the streets of Moscow protesting that day. I remember reading an interview the next day in the press in which a, journalist, uh, which a journalist had conducted with a young female university student who was arrested that afternoon. She was in her second year at Moscow State University, one of Moscow, Russia's most prestigious schools. She came from a very good, well-connected family in Moscow. She seemed to have everything going for her. Why, the interviewer asked her, did she risk at all to demonstrate and get arrested? And her answer was very simple. She thought Putin and his cronies had only one goal, 
stay in power and continue to rake in huge sums of money from the state and Russia's major industries. She said she not, saw no future perspective in her country. She saw no real hope, things needed to change. Well, this story leads into my first point, that the growing popular indignation against Putin's rule, particularly among younger Russians, <laughs> The views expressed by that young woman in 2017 have now been embraced, I think, by many more young people. Other observers, including Jill Doherty, the longtime CNN correspondent in Moscow, and now a fellow at the Wilson Center, have also noticed and written about this. The phenomenon is growing. In the past few months, Russian, numerous Russian observers have noted that the young people at the pro Navalny rallies over the last two months are now not just educated liberal students and activists in Moscow and Petersburg. You see a broader cross-section of young people in the society turning out. They're angry about their economic plight and not just about Navalny. We've seen a similar phenomenon over the past year in demonstrations in Khabarovsk over the Kremlin's arrest of a popular governor, but there were a lot of other things that contributed to that protest. Earlier this year, the Levada Center, Russia's most uh, reliable public polling organization, published a poll which showed that 46% of Russians aged 18 to 24 do not approve of Russia's, of Putin's performance as president. This compares to 31% in a similar poll last year at this time, a 15% increase. What are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about the famous Putin generations, young adults who were born after the end of the Soviet Union and whom Putin has attempted to cultivate and enlist as his supporters. While those efforts may have had some success earlier, I think the Kremlin's efforts now seem to be failing. At the same time, Putin's numbers have been going down. The main opposition figure, the now jailed Alexei Navalny, has seen his numbers go up. The Carnegie Moscow office political analyst Andrei Kolesnikov recently wrote, and I'm quoting here, Navalny has the support of the young, a group which is just several years ago was far more conformist in character. His approval rating, Navalny's, is high, 36% in the 18 to 24 age group, and comparatively high at 23% among those aged 25 to 39. In the very youngest group, the approval level for the opposition leader is 43%. Now, Levada Senator Lev Gudkov told the press in announcing some of these recent poll results, quote, the pandemic became a tipping point for irritation in Russia that's already been accumulating. It's also due to Alexei Navalny, indignation at his arrest, and the success of his film about Putin's $1.5 billion Black Sea Palace, uh, which has now been watched by more than 108 million people on YouTube. Now, Gudkov also acknowledged that Putin still enjoys support among older Russians with his approval rating uh, increasing as you, each, as you go up the ladder of each age group. Overall, uh, he found that 64% of Russians approved of the president, while 34% disapproved. This was unchanged from a poll conducted in October 2020. In response to a separate question, though, the Levada poll found that the proportion of Russians overall who unprompted named Putin as the politician they most trust in the country had slipped from 34% to 25, 29% in the course of five months. Now, all of this is not to say that Putin's regime is in any danger of falling, far from it. But popular attitudes are clearly changing in Russia, and COVID has had an impact. The economy is clearly one of the main reasons for this downturn, which leads me into my second point. The Russian economy has been relatively stagnant for years, and the pandemic has only made the situation worse. Clearly, the economy <clears throat> is one of the main reasons for uh, this downturn, and the, down, the, the Russian GDP has essentially dropped to about th dropped by about 3.5 percent over the last year when the pandemic raged in, in Russia and around the world. This is, of course, considerably less than some other developed Western economies, but it's still significant. The longer-term trends, however, are still very bad. And here's, I think, the, one of the key points. The Russian economy has, on average, grown little since the 2008-2009 world financial crisis. In, put it in context, from 1998 to 2008, the Russian economy averaged a 7% rate of GDP growth. This growth helped produce a massive increase in household income and a decline in poverty. 
It was due in no small part to the dramatic rise in the price of oil during these years. However, more recently, the economy has settled into a prolonged state of very low growth, particularly after the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014. One of my diplomatic colleagues has estimated that overall Russian growth, if you go back over the last quarter century, has really amounted to only two-thirds of 1%. Until recently, Russia had done pretty well on the macroeconomic side of the ledger. The central bank president, Elvira Nabulina, and the finance minister, Anton Silanov, had really effectively curtailed inflation to a targeted 4%, and Russia had built up huge exchange reserves of almost $590 billion. It also has, by the way, a national welfare fund, which is derived from excess energy profits, and that's uh, roughly around $183 billion, or 12% of GDP. So you can see they've stockpiled a lot of money. However, in the last few months, inflation has jumped. It's risen to 5.8%, and the government has clamped price controls on basic food items as popular anger grew over skyrocketing bread, sugar, and pasta prices. These rising food prices have actually hit Russians very hard, especially those who have been suffering, who've lost jobs, uh, who have no income anymore during the pandemic. There's been a steady decline in disposable incomes before the COVID pandemic, but it's been exacerbated by the pandemic. Some people estimate that today's average uh, disposable income is one-fifth lower than it was in 2013. And here we go, is the tie-in to the popular dissatisfaction that I have talked about. I think overall there's no secret why Russia is caught in what appears to be an unending cycle of economic stagnation. The business climate is bad, corruption is rampant, Western sanctions continue to have a negative impact on the economy, and the state continues to take control of more and more of the economy. Two-thirds of the Russian economy is now estimated to be under state control. And, of course, Russia's reliance on energy experts has not changed much at all. Instead of economic reform and opening up the economy, Putin has increasingly closed the economy off from the world to the disadvantage, I believe, of ordinary Russian citizens. Is it any wonder that thousands of educated young Russians have been leaving Russia for work in high-tech centers in the U.S. and in Europe in recent years? Now, one of the most outspoken analysts of this phenomenon has been Alexei Kudrin, a name some of you may know, a longtime friend of Putin from St. Petersburg and former finance minister and deputy prime minister. He's currently chamber, chairman of the accounts chamber. On January 13, 2017, the last time I saw him, he was uh, made a presentation to the Gaidar Economic Forum in Moscow. This is one of the premier economic uh, discussion forums uh, in Russia. And he bluntly told the international audience then that the old Russian economic model just wasn't working anymore. He said Russia faced serious challenges, including the country's demographic problems, lack of investment, economic sanctions, and Russia's distancing itself from world markets. He said Russia was technologically backward, had low productivity, and suffered from poor quality of public administration. He concluded that the main problems lie inside Russia, and its main problems are the institutional and structural problems that have accumulated today. Now, Kudrin struck similar notes in October 2018, this is after I'd left Russia, when he said that most of Russia's troubles were self-inflicted, an issue of domestic institutional structural reforms, as he put it. He said that if current inertia and in policy continues, and I think it has, the relationship with the United States will not improve for five years and can only happen under different leadership in Russia and the states. He seemed to believe that Russia will not succeed without improving its relationship with the United States. Now, another way to look at Russia's economic position, and I'm spending some time on this because I think it's really critical to understanding the, the underlying uh, factors that, uh, that uh, animate political as well as uh, social uh, activity in the country. Another way to look at this is that when Putin took over as president in May 2000. Russia was still emerging economically from the trauma of the 1998 financial crisis. Putin promised Russians that he would raise their standard of living and ensure what he called dynamic economic growth. He estimated in particular that Russia could reach Portugal's level of per capita GDP within 15 years if it kept to an 8% annual growth rate, or it could even hit France's or the UK's level if growth reached 10%. 
On a recent web conference, uh, a Russia specialist at Harvard used the uh, purchasing power parity statistic to compare Russia and Portugal and uh, today to see how far Putin has been able to succeed in his efforts. According, and this is what I'm going to give you now, is before the, uh, the pandemic. These are numbers from before the pandemic and their impact on the economies of all countries. According to the World Bank uh, uh, purchasing power parity statistics, Portugal's GDP in 2019 was at $36,639. Russia was at $29,181, a $7,000 plus discrepancy. Why is Russian growth stagnant? Well, I think Putin's 2014 decision to invade Crimea and subvert the Donbass, as well as his, its resultant economic fallout, was a major cause, which now leads me into my third point. The cost of Putin's attempt to extend Russia's power and influence in what Russians call their near abroad has been significant. In addition to the impact on the overall economy, Putin's attempt to make Russia a great power again has cost Russia both investment and foreign credits. Military power is a key part of being a great power, but so is economic development. Russia's actions in Ukraine and elsewhere have led to widespread criticism in the West and a sort of semi-isolation in the world. Western leaders talk to Putin, but you don't see him being invited to visit Western capitals. The latest statistics I've seen on Russia's costs in Ukraine alone show that they're spending roughly $5 billion a year there. This is composed of a budget subsidy of about $3 billion and an infrastructure investment of about $2 billion a year in a region that is one of the most corrupt places I have ever visited uh, during my foreign service career. Now, Russia is also still putting additional monies into Syria, uh, but it's very hard to calculate that because the Russian military budget is so uh, untransparent. Now, Putin, I think, is going to continue to pay uh, to put this money in. It's uh, For him, it's a relatively small, small amount, but it's also a key part of his program to make Russia great again, uh, to make it a great power respected in the world. Now, Overall, I think despite uh, its current military saber rattling, Russia is fundamentally in uh, what one of my good friends has called the post-imperial period. Putin and his colleagues have tried to roll back some of the changes of 1991 when the Soviet empire collapsed, but I think Putin's only been marginally successful. Russia is still an economically declining power, as I've laid out. Putin still hopes, however, to use Russia's modernized nuclear arsenal and improve conventional capabilities which were largely paid for by the energy windfalls of the first decade of this century in order to enhance Russia's great power status. I think, however, that it's unlikely that Russia can keep pace with China and with us as long as it doesn't reform its economy. Its continued reliance on the energy sector and failure to diversify really doesn't augur well for the long term. I've long thought that Dmitry Trenin, who is the director of the Carnegie Center, Moscow Center, had it right when he argued back in 2011 in a book he had he entitled The Post Imperium. And here I am quoting from Dmitry. says, Russia is no longer an empire, and it's not going to be one again. However, many features established in the imperial period are still felt to this day. Russia is not merely lost in transition, but also in translation. The real name of the game is historical transformation, which takes much longer, generations rather than years or even decades. And it has no immediately identified and, and identifiable end station. Now, many diplomats of my generation spent substantial parts of our careers dealing with the fallout of Russia's imperial decline and Putin's attempt to reverse it. Trenin argues that it's not just the desire to reassert Russia's control over its neighbors that we need to pay attention to. We also need to understand that following this path is also preventing Russia from moving ahead with its own internal transformation or its own internal modernization. He put it succinctly in the, this final statement. I'll read you. Russia is no longer an empire, but it is not yet a nation state either. To be seen as a great power in the 21st century, it has to reform its institutions and economy and become a great country. I think this remains true today as, it, as true today as it was in 2011. The problem, however, is that Putin and many in the Russian elite, particularly the Siloviki, the hardline former officers in the intelligence services, who are some of Putin's closest national security advisors, they still don't accept this point. There's no recognition yet 
among these people that trying to run a 19th century imperial policy abroad is not very consistent with building a successful 21st century global economic power. Now, the military exercises which Russian forces have conducted over the past weeks in Crimea and in Western Russia, adjacent to the Ukrainian Donbas region, they appear to be, at this point, classic saber rattling, designed to intimidate the Ukrainians and to show the Biden administration and our European allies the potential of Russian power. I don't think this has surprised anyone, frankly, in the uh, Biden administration. In its most recent public assessment, I've seen the Pentagon officials have said that the current intelligence does not indicate that this land force, and I'm told it's somewhere in the 80 to 100,000 troops participating in the maneuvers, that this land force is prepared for offensive operations in the next days, partly because there's no evidence of logistics, spare parts, fuel, and medical capabilities being organized that would be needed uh, to be able to conduct a massive military campaign of invading uh, Ukraine. Now, obviously, this can change quickly. There's things we don't know. The danger of miscalculation is always there. Uh, the Pentagon has also said there are no indicators that Russia has been reducing its forces or signaling a de-escalation. And this is the reason why you've seen President Biden and his key foreign policy advisors, as well as NATO and European leaders, repeatedly calling on Putin to de-escalate. This leads me to the last part of my presentation. How does the Biden administration, how are they setting out to deal with Russia? Let's go back for a second to January. Most foreign policy experts cheered when Biden reached quick agreement with Putin in their first phone call on January 26th. They agreed to review for five, they agreed to renew for five years the US Russia New START arms control agreement, which had been signed by Presidents Obama and Medvedev in 2011. This is a relatively easy action, and it signaled a desire to maintain a stable nuclear balance with Russia, even as both sides discussed other areas of contention. In that same call, Putin and Biden agreed to explore strategic stability discussions on a range of arms control and other emergency security issues. I think this is good too. New technologies and weapons, cyber warfare, military buildup of China, changing international situation will all impact both countries and force them, I think, to find some areas where common ground is possible in achieving greater stability in a very unstable world. At the same time, and here's uh, the key, Biden didn't shrink in his first phone call with Putin from speaking candidly about the problems in U.S.-Russian relations. He reaffirmed our support for Ukraine sovereignty, and the administration quickly and subsequently announced a $125 million security assistance package for Ukraine. Biden raised the Russian solar winds hacking attacks and the troubling reports of Russian officers offering bounties to Taliban soldiers if they kill American soldiers in Afghanistan. Biden also criticized Russia's poisoning of opposition leader Alexei Navalny and his imprisonment on returning to Russia from medical treatment in Germany. Not long after that first call, the Biden administration joined several, joined European Union in sanctioning seven senior Russian figures for their roles in Navalny's poisoning and his subsequent imprisonment. A few days after that call, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, disclosed that the administration was reviewing the malign activities Russia had engaged in during the Trump administration. He said the administration would be announcing within a few weeks a number of steps to address those issues. Sure enough, on April 13th, the administration announced steps that it planned to take. This included formal designation of the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service as the party responsible in Russia for the solar winds hack that damaged U.S. government and private sector computer operations, the expulsion of 10 Russian diplomats, in Russia and Washington and New York who were serving as intelligence officers. The signing of an executive order which imposed new sanctions on Russia, specifically barring US financial institutions from participating in the primary market for bonds issued by the Russian Central Bank and other leading financial institutions. This will drive probably drive down Russian bond prices and push interest rates up, making it more expensive for Russia to keep their own country running. Uh, the U.S. will also sanction six Russian tech companies that were involved in the SolarWinds cyber attacks, as well as 32 entities who were involved, including a number of firms connected to Putin's friend uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, 
the uh, man who owns, owns these restaurants and catering services, but also runs a whole series of programs, including the kind of paramilitary Wagner group that's been active in Ukraine and uh, a number of other countries. Um, in announcing these steps, Jake Sullivan said the administration intended to strike a balance, really provide a significant and credible response, but also not to escalate the situation. President Biden subsequently said uh, that he could have chosen tougher sanctions, but he chose to be proportionate. Both the president and Sullivan knew that the Russians would retaliate, and of course they have. They've ordered 10 of our diplomats to leave, and they've said they're not going to issue uh, visas to eight prominent officials in the Biden and Trump administrations. President Putin's diplomatic advisor, Yuri Ushakov, also told our ambassador in Moscow, John Sullivan, that he should go home for consultations, paralleling the recall of Russian ambassador to Moscow for uh, uh, and Tonov, uh, who had gone back for consultations. And I read this morning that Sullivan has now decided to do so. Now, I'm told that there were other sanctions which were also discussed within the Biden ad inter administration, within the interagency groups that deal with Russia. These were not chosen. In the end, a consensus emerged around the idea that the United States should send a strong public message to Putin, hopefully without cutting off chances, for setting the relationship on a more stable keel. At the same time, I also understand we've told the Russians privately that the, of the kinds of sanctions that we're prepared to impose if they engage in further malign behavior. Now, all of this was reflected again in the second Biden-Putin phone call last week, uh, when Biden, I think, was what I was told was very tough with Putin over Ukraine, telling him he should de-escalate his uh, military exercises there. Significantly, Biden also, however, proposed to meet Putin in a working summit meeting sometime in the next few weeks or months. I think Putin must have surprised Putin. Judging from the Russian uh, hesitant reaction, they didn't seem to be expecting such a proposal coming at the same time that we were telling them that we were going to impose additional sanctions on them. The Kremlin has now apparently said they view the proposal positively and that they will part uh, that not only will Putin participate in the virtual climate change conference, which President Biden is convening this Thursday with world leaders, but that they, they will, uh, sounds like, uh, be ready to meet at some point over the next uh, weeks or months um, in a summit meeting and a third site somewhere in Europe, presum <clears throat> excuse me, presumably. I think Biden wants to use that summit to discuss strategic stability and also see if he can launch possible arms control and other negotiations with uh, Russia um, so, that, uh, so that we can try to move forward on some of these overarching security issues that uh, are so important specifically as technologies have changed, as weapons have changed. And I think I, my understanding is that Putin really wants to do this. He favors uh, these kinds of talks. Jake Sullivan talked yesterday by phone with the head of Russia's Security Council, Nikolai Patrashev, about a possible summit and about these security issues. So the process is moving forward. So bottom line, it seems to me that we now have the essence of the emerging Biden policy toward Russia, a readiness to engage with Russia in promoting greater strategic stability, as well as addressing climate change, limiting the Iranian nuclear program, dealing with the Arctic and perhaps other issues of mutual interest, while at the same time firmly responding to the problems that have plunged the U.S.-Russian bilateral relationship to its lowest level since the depths of the Cold War. Clearly, the Biden approach is substantially different from his predecessors. He has no intention, he has said repeatedly, of launching a reset of U.S.-Russian relations along the traditional lines of previous administrations. But in a way, though, if you think about it, he is trying to reset the relationship to reflect what he sees as a likely long-term competition from Russia. This long-term competition was reflected in the just-released intelligence community threat assessment, uh, which had a big section on Russia. And it begins with these two paragraphs, which I want to read because I think it summarizes the underlying uh, worries that Russia, that the administration has about Russia. Quote, Moscow will continue to employ a variety of tactics this year meant to undermine U.S. influence, develop new international norms and partnerships, divide Western countries and weaken Western alliances, and demonstrate Russia's ability to shape global events as a major player in a new multipolar international order. Russia will continue to develop its military, nuclear, space, 
cyber and intelligence capabilities while actively engaging abroad and leveraging its economic resources to advance its agenda and undermine the United States. We expect Moscow to seek opportunities for pragmatic cooperation with Washington on its own terms, and we assess that Russia does not want a direct conflict with U.S. forces. So I think what we're seeing is the president and his key advisors trying to find a way of managing the clash of our fundamentally different global and political interests within the, with the Putin regime across a broad spectrum and to avoid conflict. Central to his approach is obviously rebuilding our ties with our allies and forging a common approach with them toward Russia. I think in the back of his mind, Biden hopes that he can assure, he can develop a more stable relationship with Russia, which will permit him to deal with what the administration sees as a big, the biggest emerging threat to our country, and that's China. I think uh, Biden will look uh, will likely have a harder time, frankly, convincing our allies to forge a common line toward Beijing than he will toward uh, Moscow. So Biden last Thursday in his press conference said the following, summarizing, I think, succinctly his approach. Quote, I find that we can both operate in the mutual self-interest of our countries as a new start agreement and make it clear to Russia that we are very concerned about their behavior, whether it's Navalny, whether it's the solar winds, or whether it's the reports of bounties on the heads of Americans in Afghanistan. I will not hesitate to raise those issues with the Russians. And we shouldn't forget, by the way, that several other fundamental key tenets are at the root of President Biden's approach. He's not prepared to concede that Russia has a right to a sphere of influence in Ukraine or anywhere else in Eastern Europe. And the administration clearly expects disagreement there. The national threat assessment says, quote, Moscow is well positioned to increase its role in the Caucasus, intervene in Belarus if it deems necessary, and continue destabilization efforts against Ukraine while settlement talks remain stalled and low-level fighting continues. I think Biden will also oppose Putin's espousal of an authoritarian government model. He will continue to push for democracy and human rights, which have been a part of the traditional base of our policy toward the Soviet Union and Russia since the signing of the Helsinki Final Act in 1976. And as Biden has said many times, most recently last Friday when he hosted the new prime minister of Japan, he wants to show that democracy works at home and abroad and that it can benefit ordinary people. In closing, and I'm sorry if I've gone on a little too long, I think it's also important to note that in his phone call and actions last week toward Russia, Biden seized the initiative. He sought to define the relationship we will have over the immediate future. He put his ideas out on the table. And judging from some of the initial Russian reactions that I've read, they're still scrambling a bit to figure out how to handle this new American approach. Putin himself, of course, has shown himself to be a master tactician during his rule of Russia. He, could try to, he still could try to seize the initiative back, do something dramatic to redefine the rules of the game. But he does have strong interest, I think, in engaging Biden, giving some, given some of the domestic trends I outlined at the beginning of this presentation. So the question is, can Biden administration succeed in making this policy of pragmatic engagement work while also holding firm to key principal position, positions? And I think that's the key question to which nobody knows the answer today. We may get some better indications of Putin's views a little later today because he's giving, excuse me, tomorrow, because he's giving his uh, the Russian equivalent of the State of the Union address uh, tomorrow in uh, Moscow. One last point. In addition to dealing with the Kremlin, President Biden is also going to have to manage a very wide variety of domestic views about Russia in the public and in our Congress as he forges ahead in trying to deal with this country. At that point, let me stop and say that I look forward to uh, hearing from the professors and to, uh, to our discussion. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, John. I, I thought that was brilliant. Um, I love the, the three trends. Um, the under 35 is asking, what about our future? That look at this long and deep trough and the decline in the standard of living. And then, you know, how Putin's imperial ambitions really don't help with either of those. But I must say the one that delighted me most was the idea that Putin could be scrambling because we've seized the initiative. Way to go. <laughs> 
it's now my honor to introduce today's panel. Um, joining Ambassador Teft, we have Professor Christiana Lemka. Professor Lemka has been a visiting scholar at UNC Chapel Hill's Center for European Studies several times since 1988. She's been teaching one of UNC's required transatlantic, transatlantic master's courses for over a decade. And while maintaining her permanent faculty positions in Germany, Professor Lemka has taught courses at UNC Chapel Hill, Stanford, Harvard, and Suffolk University. From 2010 to 14, she held the Max Weber Chair at New York University. Professor Lemka's academic areas of expertise include European politics, democracy and governance in the EU, transatlantic relations, comparative politics and political theory, and American politics. She is the author and editor of numerous books and articles. Professor Limka, thank you for joining us. We also have Professor Bob Jenkins serving as our moderator today. Bob Jenkins is a beloved teaching professor in the political science department at UNC Chapel Hill. From 2001 to 15, he was director of UNC Center for Slavic, Eurasian and East European Studies. He joined the center in 1999 as administrative director for curricula and was primarily responsible for coordinating the master's degree program, which was introduced that year. His scholarly interests are in the areas of social and political change, political conflict, state building, civil society in the nonprofit sector, and education. Prior to joining Carolina, Bob was an independent consultant and researcher, as well as professor, a professor at Yale University. Professor Jenkins has traveled widely through Eastern Europe and has lived in Budapest and Vienna. Professor Jenkins, thank you for joining and for facilitating today's panel. I'll hand things over to you to get us started. All right, thank you for the nice introduction, Ambassador Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Teft, for uh, excellent remarks. Uh, very stimulating. I'm going to uh, keep my remarks uh, to a bare minimum. And uh, in that spirit, uh, Christiana, if you don't mind, I might actually let you start and then I'll just uh, sweep up a few things uh, at the end. I think Christiana is going to speak about European and particularly German perspectives on Russia. And then I'll say a few things about NATO, but uh, in the spirit of time, I'll keep those quite limited. Christiana, please go ahead. Thank you, Bob. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Ambassador Teft, for a brilliant uh, presentation here. You laid out the current situation uh, and also the positioning of the Biden administration very clearly to us. I would like to add a, a European perspective. I am speaking from Berlin at this point, um, and I have three brief points. Um, I've been teaching and researching transatlantic relations for many years. And um, from my perspective, what we see with the Biden administration is really an attempt to uh, fundamentally change uh, US foreign policy towards the allies in Europe. The Trump legacy was devastating, uh, especially in Germany, approval rates of uh, President Trump uh, were um, at an all-time low. Um, so there is a lot of repairing in transatlantic relations going on, uh, which I think is, is great and very important for tackling future issues, that we have a strong transatlantic relationship between European countries, the EU on one side, and the United States. So I very much welcome your uh, remarks uh, to showing that Biden is actually taking a different approach. Um, just yesterday, um, the two major parties in Germany decided on their, uh, you know, uh, major candidates for the elections in Germany. And here in this country, we take a strong interest in the development in Russia and in Ukraine. Um, Germany, Chancellor Merkel and uh, French President Macron met with the Ukrainian president just recently uh, to reaffirm solidarity. Um, the uh, Germans have strong economic interests in Russia. But what we see uh, for the fall elections in Germany is, and that's one of my uh, points here, 
uh, there could be a, a change in foreign policy when the Green Party uh, does as well as it looks right now and will reshape foreign policy um, moving away from the um, primacy of economic interests in Russia. Nord Stream 2 is something they clearly reject. Um, so moving away from this kind of pure German uh, trade policy um, and uh, emphasizing more human rights, uh, emphasizing a common European approach and also uh, a stronger coordination with the United States. There are different streams here in Germany of how to approach Russia, but I think it is a key country in the European Union uh, and one country to watch very closely uh, especially with regards to uh, political developments in the elections here in fall. Uh, my third point, and I have to be very brief, I know there are a lot of questions out there, is about the European Union as such. Um, it is very interesting that um, the European Union has actually coordinated its policies towards Russia quite well. Uh, there's always criticism about EU foreign policy saying, well, 27 countries, they all speak with different voices, they can never agree on anything. This is not true regarding uh, Russia. After the uh, annexation of Crimea, uh, there was a strong and coordinated response. Um, just recently, EU foreign ministers met with the Ukrainian leader, um, and there is some, uh, you know, signs of uh, solidarity here. And the sanctions the EU imposed are uh, coordinated and quite strict. So yes, the European Union um, thinks Russia is an important country for Europe, for the European Union. But no, uh, we reject uh, the authoritarian and the human rights violation and the violations of international law concerning Crimea and uh, Ukraine. Um, what uh, will the future look like? I think one of the important points that we really need to uh, address is uh, how can the US and the EU work together, closer together, coordinate policies and what could be, what could be a common ground? And I think that um, you know, there is no um, uh, one single topic, uh, but clearly de-escalation of military confrontation is uh, important. I also think that climate change policy could be a common ground for both the US under Biden and the European Union working for a stronger policy to fight climate change and Russia can be a part, has to be a part, the same applies to China, by the way. And I would like to uh, conclude here. I did not touch on security issues because that's actually Bob's role here. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Christiana. Uh, so just briefly, I, I would like to note um, that, you know, the post-Cold War NATO-Russian relationship uh, has had various twists and turns. Uh, it began uh, in a kind of spirit of cooperation, though uh, it's frequently noted that NATO enlargement challenged Russia's notion of spheres of influence. Uh, and uh, I would actually add to that uh, a point that the ambassador made in his remarks, uh, NATO's embrace of democracy and new member states challenges Russia's perceptions. Uh, of threat as well. Uh, and uh, that may be equally challenging to the military challenge uh, that we see. Uh, of course, uh, first in Georgia, though the response there was less united, and then uh, in Ukraine, where NATO did respond uh, fairly united, we see the traditional military strength of the alliance coming out. And that's most visible in the enhanced foreign presence, uh, which has deployed uh, small battle groups uh, to the Baltic states and to Poland. Uh, and has really united uh, NATO as long as well as uh, uh, increased commitment to burden sharing, the so-called 2% of GDP commitment that came out uh, of the Wales summit. Um, finally, NATO's responded by increasing its uh, technological and scientific efforts as well. It's developed new centers of excellence. Uh, those are very important uh, in the full range of spectrum of security. Uh, and I think those are very positive. Um, so in, in a way, Russia's behavior has, uh, has galvanized the NATO response to a certain extent, and certainly within the realm of, 
of a defensive alliance, uh, much more than an aggressive alliance, which is NATO's or as Russia's claim, excuse me. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, start a quick question for the ambassador. Um, your presentation uh, focused on what we might call uh, a carrots and sticks approach to Russia. Um, uh, it's a kind of combination of, uh, of traditional uh, hard military approach, uh, though uh, softened by the realities of, uh, of the post-Cold War environment with uh, chances for cooperation. And you talked about it mostly in bilateral terms. I'd like to open that up to some of the bigger multilateral issues that, that we face. Um, obviously, uh, Iran is one that's on everyone's agenda right now uh, and a retreat from uh, the Trump administration policy there, an attempt to, to get uh, both the US and Iran back into the joint comprehensive agreement. Uh, but there are other places like Syria or Libya. Uh, and uh, you mentioned and Christiana mentioned climate change in China. I would add one area that hasn't been mentioned yet, and that's the Arctic. Where do you see possibilities of cooperation uh, for the US and Russia in a multilateral context? Thanks very much for your uh, your question. Uh, uh, I did actually slip in the Arctic there in part because uh, I uh, spent some time when I was ambassador in Moscow from 2014 to 2017 uh, working on Arctic Council things. We were the chair for a number of the couple of years in that period, and it was actually one of those areas which. Uh, you know, for want of a better term, we kind of walled off from all of the other bilateral problems. And we had visits by American experts and uh, the, there would be meetings. I think there was one in Helsinki and then there was another in Norway uh, during my time there. And we actually tried to, uh, to, to find common ground. There's The Arctic Council does a lot of good work on a variety of things uh, related to uh, uh, environment uh, and uh, uh, helping the 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 peoples, the native peoples who live in the northern parts of the, many of the Arctic uh, countries. The problem has always been uh, the Russians talk uh, in the Arctic Council about all of this development, but uh, going alongside that, and I would probably even argue over the last year or two, there's been increasing Russian militarization of uh, the Arctic. And so I think, as you know, Professor, there's a lot of debate back here among Russia specialists about, you know, are we are we, are we being hornswoggled to use the uh, American term uh, by the Russians that as they build up their military prowess up in the northern channel, as it now becomes much more open to bring ships through there with climate change and the melting of the polar ice, um, are we should we be doing more militarily? And we've done, I think, recently an exercise at the end of last year up in the top of Norway. And I know we're in the process of looking at, uh, if not building, renting some icebreakers because we haven't really invested in those kinds of things. I would like to think and hope that we can find ways that are cooperative. What I fear is that uh, President Putin and his people see the Arctic now as they see the near abroad. They've got to have it, control it, and make sure that everything is determined according to their desiderata and not necessarily according to the international uh, opinion, shall we say. I, and I, the one thing I, I do think is uh, reacting to both of your comments is that I think climate change can actually be one of those areas where we can work with not just with Europe, Professor Lemke. And, and I think that's, uh, that's moving. John Kerry has already been traveling and visiting and we'll see Thursday and Friday at this uh, virtual summit. But I think there can even be a way to deal with, with Russia because Russia has serious problems. Uh, that relate to climate change. The, the, the tundra is, is, is basically unfreezing, and it's already caused environmental disasters, a huge problem at Norilsk up in northern Russia where uh, a, a, uh, an oil facility broke and put uh, polluted thousands of acres of land. Um, there's areas where we can work together. There, I'd like to, like to be able to see us do it. Thank you. Uh, Christiana, would you like to pose a question? Yeah, I mean, um, one of the key issues uh, you touched upon at the end of your talk was how do you strike a balance between, yes, we want to engage Russia, but at the same time, we want to, um, we want to maintain our kind of 
a value-based foreign policy, meaning democracy, human rights, uh, protection of the environment. These are very important, you know, uh, um, basic values that uh, we want to maintain and strengthen, and we don't want to give up and just say, well, um, when we deal with Russia, uh, it's that is not important or secondary important. But how do you strike this balance? I mean, between uh, these uh, two contrasting goals? It's hard. That's why I posed it. And you're right to raise the issue. I think this is going to be the great challenge uh, with the administration. But I, you know, I've, I've known President Biden as a senator and as vice president. I've worked with him. He's visited countries where I've served as ambassador. And if anybody can do this, it's probably him, Professor, because he, he can be uh, both very tough and engaging at the same time. He's one of the most uh, capable I think American politicians, and I don't just say that because he's the president. I've, I've watched a lot of American politicians in action over the years, especially dealing with Russia and Ukraine and some of these places that I've served. Um, I think what we've seen in the phone calls with Putin is, is, is what we're going to continue to try to get. And I think Biden will continue to push both to keep open, you know, whether it's carrots and sticks or however we want to characterize it. Um, the key question is, will Putin play this game? And uh, I, I think, at least from what I the read I got from the, the second phone call last week, is that Putin is very much interested in getting things going on not only strategic arms control, follow on to uh, the new START agreement, but he wants to do something in the intermediate range because he knows his own economic problems he also knows that the United States is, uh, and China are the two great economic powers in the world, and he sees the United States pursuing policies now that are going to stimulate our economy. And, you know, yes, we have a big debt, but we're going to be able to have more money coming in through taxes and undoubtedly maintain a very healthy defense uh, budget over years. And Russia, just as Gorbachev had to face it back in the Soviet period, Russia has a hard time dealing with the economic power of the United States, and for that matter, for Germany and other countries as well. They, they have a very serious weakness. So I think he has an incentive to try to do this, and hopefully that will triumph over his fear of democracy and his anger at Navalny and uh, you know, hopefully he will pull back on some of these crazy things he's trying to do with Ukraine, where the majority of people, as polls show, want to be part of the West. They want to be not part of any kind of Russian neo-empire or uh, under their sphere of influence. They want to be connected and travel and work and do things with uh, Europe and the United States. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to open it up. We're, we're close to the end of time, but we'll see if we can squeeze a few extra minutes. Uh, Adnan Jumur, who's the Associate Director of the Center for Slavic, Eurasian, and East European Studies, uh, has been uh, looking at questions that have been put uh, in the question and answer. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Adi to uh, give us a, a good, strong question here now, please. Yes, <clears throat> thank you all for a delightful um, conversation. A lot of questions um, that are coming in um, are touching on Ukraine. Obviously, Ukraine is on everyone's mind. Um, considering um, what's been going on there over the last few weeks. Um, and this question kind of ties nicely to uh, Professor Lemke's comment about balance um, and specifically um, how does the Biden administration position itself or maintain the kind of um, openness to dealing with Russia uh, while sticking to our commitment, our US commitments to Ukraine specifically and what constraints and, and uh, possibilities does this create for the new administration? I think Joe Biden doesn't obviously want uh, war with Russia. Uh, he doesn't want American forces fighting with Russia. So I don't think you're going to see American troops on the ground in Ukraine trying to defend Ukraine. That said, what we've seen during the Trump administration and uh, already now, uh, this uh, new administration has put up $125 million for additional security assistance. The, the, the Ukrainian military is much better prepared now than they were in 2014 when Russia invaded. That doesn't mean that they can withstand a, a Russian invasion of four armies as they've got positioned over on the Russian side of the border now. 
but they have the ability to uh, to detect uh, firing of mortars and rockets against them. They have Javelin anti-tank missiles, which are the best anti-tank missiles uh, that exist. Uh, and they've got other capabilities, which not only we, but other NATO allies have provided them. Uh, plus, they've been trained and done better. So uh, there's a, a more of a deterrent, I would argue, on the Ukrainian side, as I understand it, than there was before. But it's still a very uh, dangerous situation because clearly Russia has invested heavily in so many uh, new systems themselves. Uh, but, you know, I was on a, just maybe one more point. I, I was on a web conference the other day and somebody said, what would happen if Russia tried to take uh, the southern part of Ukraine where the canal that uh, goes from Crimea to Dnipro River because Crimea is always deficient in water, and this canal was built in the even I think in the Soviet times to bring uh, water from the Dnipro River into Ukraine into Crimea, and that's shut off now. And the response from one of the Ukrainians who had been involved in defense work said, "Don't forget, if they try to do this, this is a lot of land that they're going to have to protect with their troops, and Ukrainians will fight." there will be guerrilla warfare. Uh, and so, you know, I think people in Moscow have to factor that in. And as we all know from the Chechen period, uh, there was one of the biggest groups that came out then with the mothers against the war in Chechnya because they were tired of their sons uh, and husbands coming home in body bags from fighting there. So this is a sensitive issue inside domestically in Russia as well. Thank you. Uh, can we get another question from the audience, please? Sure. Um, a couple of people are wondering about the future of Russia after Putin um, and how does uh, Putin uh, maintain the continuity of his policies um, beyond his lifetime um, or even speculating on the possibility of something bad happening to Putin. Um, what would that transition look like in those circumstances? Well, if th those who ask that question have the answer, I know some people who pay a lot of money for a good, uh, a good serious answer on that one. I did a paper, I work uh, part-time for the RAND Corporation uh, here in uh, Washington, and I did a paper about a year and a half ago about the, uh, trying to understand the factors that will impact the succession. Now, the hard part is that, of course, there's only one guy who knows uh, what the succession will be, and that's Vladimir Putin himself, and I don't think he's talking to too many people. He's now signed a law which will allow him to run two more times uh, to stay in power till he's 83 years old. Uh, I wouldn't bet on that. I think uh, uh, given a life of tension and stress and the rest of it, uh, living and working and operating well uh, is gonna be hard. I think the key part of this to understand, and I don't have any particular insights, is the Russian elites. You know, the Russian elites are actually uh, united on the surface because and Putin insists they be united. But there's actually wide divergence of views uh, that I saw when I was in Moscow, and I'm sure they've only grown. One of the best explanations I had for his proposal last year to extend the, uh, uh, to change the constitution to allow him to run two more times was that he was afraid that the, the elites were already jockeying for position for when he was uh, going to, uh, to leave the scene, not just for who might succeed him, but what their economic and political positions all might be. So he basically pulled the rug out from under them and said, I may stay for two more terms. Um, that's not gonna stop the Russian elites. I know too much, too many of these people, and I know that this is going to be a continuing issue for them. Um, ultimately though, it's, uh, it's Vladimir Putin who has to decide how and on what terms to do it. And then there's a very serious question is, can he keep Putinism in place given the problems that they have? Will the successor, come in and want to try to change things to remedy some of those problems quickly or perhaps over time. Let me just follow up on that, Ambassador. What do you mean when you speak of Putinism? Um, well, we could have another whole session on this, Professor. It's, uh, I think it's fundamentally Vladimir Putin, the, the policy that's evolved, and he has changed over the 20 years that he's the ruled Russia, shall we say, as president or prime minister. Um, I think it's fundamentally uh, a very conservative economic policy, uh, an increasingly uh, repressive autocratic uh, method, and then this, this uh, neo-imperialism. He wants to basically 
go back to where he was in, uh, I would even say he's a man of the 1980s, you know, that uh, dividing Europe and uh, trying to uh, restore the, the so-called near abroad, the areas within the former Soviet Union. These are all part of what he wants to do. But because they don't have the economic resources to do this, they, they haven't been able to succeed. Now, you can go a lot further and talk about other transformations in the society itself, but I think those three are still the, the big issues that, uh, uh, that reflect his approach. Um, and I, I think some of them are leading in the wrong direction. They're not, uh, they have an impact and a negative impact on each other, as I tried to outline in my remarks. And those are each all three related to uh, his decreasing popularity at home, I would suggest. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, the biggest uh, uh, the development on popularity took place after I left in 2018. Uh, they announced that they were going to change the uh, retirement age. Uh, and uh, you'll remember that the people, old people, went out on the streets, not young kids from the university, but old people, because when they changed the male uh, pension age to 65, everybody knows that the average life expectancy in Russia is now 65. <laughs> so if you're looking at the averages, it doesn't look too good for, for your pension. Uh, not getting it at the age of, I think, 62 was what it was. Uh, women are a little bit higher. They live longer. Um, but still, it was, it was going to substantially impact the uh, availability of pensions to a lot of people. And it caused demonstrations or prompted demonstrations all over Russia. I think we have time for one more question from the audience. Uh, Christiana, do you wanna, go ahead, Christiana, please. Yeah, I quickly want to add, you know, that Putin is an increasingly lonely uh, autocratic leader. I mean, his circle of people is very small. And um, I also think that uh, transition from Putin to another leader will be very, very uh, complex and messy because our expectation that civil society could kind of change uh, such a system. We look at Belarus, Lukashenko is still there, you know, even though protest is widespread and you can go around the globe and uh, our expectation we had maybe 10 years ago civil society would kind of, and I actually did subscribe to this theory myself, you know, that people would rise and people would express themselves. And uh, this is the way transition would occur just like it did in Poland and Hungary in East Germany in 1989. Uh, but it doesn't seem to work that way. Um, and so I'm very, very uh, skeptical if post Putin Russia will be more democratic. Let's try to squeeze one more question from the audience. Yeah, absolutely. And the last one should probably go to a student. We have a retired um, a student who retired from the military and is now um, an undergraduate here at UNC, double majoring in global studies and peace war defense. Um, he was um, he brought up Syria uh, and Russia's involvement in, in Syria. And when he was um, um, serving in the military and, and the impression on the ground was that there was a period of time when the conflict could escalate into an armed conflict between the US forces and, and Russian troops there. So the question is, um, did the Russian deployment uh, forces in Syria come as a surprise to you? Um, and I'll add to that, maybe it's just, you know, where do you see that um, development going? We could do a whole seminar on this one too, Adi. It's, uh, uh, I, I wasn't surprised. Uh, you know, the Russians have been in Syria since the 1960s. They've had bases down there. So that's not uh, uh, a surprise. They, the fact that, uh, you know, when I arrived in Moscow, uh, John Kerry, I was there in late 20, uh, September of 2014. Uh, because of sanctions in Ukraine, John Kerry didn't come to visit until May of 20. 15, and he met Putin in Sochi at his, uh, his estate down there. And the bulk of the discussion there and at three more meetings that Kerry had in Moscow with Putin was basically Ukraine and Syria. And at the first session, per Kerry was trying to get the Russians to follow through on the commitment that they had made at the UN Security Council to try to find a political solution to the problems in Ukraine. But what was clear then and throughout the summer of 2015 is that the, the Russians, Putin put it this way, not Russians, 
Putin and the Kremlin were not prepared to move that far. And then we saw in September, uh, working with the Iranians, the Russian military started bombing and attacking. And uh, the whole idea of a transition with Assad moving aside and having free and fair elections kind of went down the drain. And that was very much a Putin-Kremlin decision. Um, I think it's just, it's heartrending, tra tragic, when you see the role Russia had in, in bombing and killing innocent people and supporting this bloodthirsty Assad regime. Uh, just when I was in Moscow, I just found it sickening to open the pages of the papers every day. Um, but what have they gotten out of it? Okay, they have their military base there, but they've still got the northern part of Syria is still basically under the control of Turkey and the Syrian Kurds. Uh, what has Russia succeeded? They have their base on the Mediterranean, so East Mediterranean uh, access to the sea is important, a place for their ships to come in. But, uh, you know, the place is just a, a god-awful mess, and Russia's not doing much to change the situation, improve the situation for Syrians. Something's got to give. Uh, I don't know when it is. I'm not a Syrian expert, but uh, uh, I'm not sure it's, it's certainly all positive for Russia at this point. Right. Well, uh, I think we've gone over time, uh, and so we don't want to abuse the privilege uh, that we have with the ambassador, and, and we actually have another engagement, uh, as uh, Ambassador Stevenson noted before. Uh, I want to thank uh, Ambassador Taft for uh, a really deep and substantive presentation. It's great to learn about uh, these, these details that you offered. I want to uh, thank Professor Limka for her uh, very insightful remarks and, and bringing a European perspective. It's very important for us in the United States to hear uh, that perspective. Uh, I thank uh, Adi for uh, helping with the questions. I want to thank the entire UNC Global staff, particularly uh, Ambassador Stevenson uh, for their work. And Ambassador McCarthy, thank you for your collaboration. Uh, she pointed out to me that we do have uh, an ambassador in the general podcast uh, on the Arctic. Uh, so, and we also uh, have a podcast uh, that addresses Syria. So many of these additional topics are available uh, in that series. I strongly recommend that you listen to it. They're very insightful uh, in terms of the relationship between the military uh, and the foreign service uh, in very important places across the globe. They also give an insight into the personal relationships and the way uh, and which uh, our, our leaders uh, and, and, uh, and foreign and military uh, servants carry out their, their daily jobs. So I can highly recommend that, that series. Uh, and I wanna thank everybody for attending today. Anyone else have a final comment? A huge thank you to all of you for proof of concept that we can use the general and the ambassador for these diplomatic discussions and really, really enrich the conversation here on campus. Thank you all. Brilliant Thank discussion, you. John. Thank you. Thank you.